So we saw in the first, our first class, right? We saw in our, last, in our first session that uh, we reviewed this question that we look into people living primitive lives as people without agency because they are subordinate to nature. And part of that metaphor of progress with which we privilege our own modernity then can link to this notion of getting ourselves out of nature, right? Becoming from a position of being dominated by nature to a position of dominating nature. Uh, and we see this then as, as fundamental to the acquisition of our own modernity. And that's the simple formula that I provide you. Human agency raised to the power of technology equals the modern self, right? That's, keep that formula in mind. We'll come back to it. Um, so therefore, when we look at primitive societies, quote unquote primitive societies that seem to have no technology, that sets the exponential factor at zero. Any number raised to the power of zero is itself. So people without technology are just people in the most basic sense, animals. It's therefore only with the acquisition of technology that we start to become the people that we think of as, as modern. Uh, but as we've started to see glimmers of already in the context of our discussion then on egalitarianism in these societies, that conditions of equality, whether we find it in the context of the Inuit and complex rituals surrounding the sharing of resources, or we find it in the Kung uh, Kalahari Bushmen through things like arrowhead exchange in order to suppress the rise of a meritocracy, what we find then is that equality is not something that sort of spawns naturally as long as we human beings are living inside of a primitive state, but instead has to be established and constantly reinforced as part of a cultural complex in which you're living, right? It's hard work to make sure that everybody remains equal. Gentlemen, I appreciate you need your computers, but if you don't mind, if we could respect my, my prohibition, those of you using computers. <coughs> um, and so this suggests, right, that uh, societies that embed within them principles of equality or egalitarianism, however we want to define that, whether it's an egalitarianism with respect to avail access and availability of resources or in terms of prestige that might come from uh, hunting, hunting prowess, hunting skill, whatever, that these have to exist or have to be embedded as a cultural feature, become part of the culture. And if we go back to the story from Lee, the, the, the Christmas in the Kalahari, when he says, you know, remember he bought the bull and they were insulting him and he was confused and upset. And finally it turned out it was because they didn't want to award or reward people for achievement. He identifies this as what he calls part of their cultural viability, right? This makes them culturally viable. So our conclusion that we, we've come to so far is that when we look at these kinds of uh, societies which embed within them equality, what we're looking at is a tool that's been developed to solve a problem. The problem being living life in a world of scarce resources, the tool then being equality in order to ensure community optimization, that you optimize the chances of the community to survive, to thrive, to reproduce, and so on. Normally when we think about introducing a tool to solve a problem, we call that innovation, right? It's a kind of technology. So our simple equation, human agency raised to the power of technology equals modernity, as soon as we start to introduce a bit of technology into these societies where at first glance we see none, now what are we doing? In a way, we're ascribing to them, even though it doesn't feel like it in any kind of real sense for us, but we're ascribing to them a kind of modernity, just like we ascribe to ourselves a kind of modernity, which then is consistent with this idea that people living 200,000 years ago had the same cognitive behavioral psychological skills that we do today. So we want to amplify on that question, this notion of a complexity in a pre-market society looking for elements of complexity that at first glance may not be visible to us because we tend to measure complexity with respect to what is left in the material record. And as we know from Solon's, a feature of these societies in order to live inside of the economic confidence that their system could provide, uh, emphasize principles of mobility and mobility is inimical to materialism. So we need to look elsewhere. And that's what we're going to do uh, in our class in this, in this session. Our reading is the really interesting work by Marcel Mauss. Um, we have a chance to read his much more famous work on the gift, which we'll be coming to in module two. Um, Marcel Mauss, for those of you who don't know, a groundbreaking, pioneering French anthropologist, ethno uh, ethnographer, um, lived in the, in the 30s, 20s and 30s, 
um, established a lot of the core practices in the field of anthropology and ethnology. So very, very famous guy. This book, The Seasonal Variations of the Eskimo, a study in social morphology, not one of his better known works, I have to say. Not, you don't usually find this on a reading list. Um, <clears throat> but it's a very interesting, it's a very interesting work. It's very short. I've provided you with a couple of chapters from it in the reading. You can go and look at it. It's very easy to read. Um, but the findings in this are really quite extraordinary. And they have been subsequently borne out in their broad uh, contours and their substance uh, with studies of other groups of people in very different parts of the world. For example, in some Amazonian uh, tribal societies, you see, this, you see the same kind of seasonal morphology that Mose is going to draw our attention to here in his study of Eskimos. I will use the word Eskimo, actually I'll pref I will preferentially use the word Inuit. Eskimo is the old word, Inuit is the better word to use, but Inuit, Eskimo, it's the same, um, it's the same thing. So uh, in this book, what Marcel Mose did was he essentially um, collected together a set of studies <coughs> around, um, around how the Inuit live their lives. Uh, and he drew some conclusions, or he observed some patterns and drew some conclusions about those studies. We're going to look at the, at, at, at the basic contours of his discussion. We're going to look, start with his uh, analysis of the different architectures that the Inuit societies use, um, the patterns of seasonality that they reflect. Uh, and then at the end, we'll be able to see these, what I'm calling, mutually supporting antinomies. Now, let's go back to that word, antinomy. We saw it at the beginning of our class. Um, we have this idea of a Hegelian process, the dialectical process of resolving anti the antinomial. Antinomies are independently viable but mutually incompatible states of being, right? That's what an antinomy is. You can be sedentary or you can be mobile, right? Both are fine, but they're mutually incompatible. Is it possible to have mutually incompatible states existing inside of the same society? We would say probably not. But we will find as a result of the Mosian analysis that this is one of the more startling conclusions that we can draw is that part of human social complexity is in fact our capacity to live in a let's call it a multi uh, or to live according to multiple antinomial states at the same at the same time uh, and if we have time we'll have maybe a little discussion at the end of some of the implications of what it is that we're that we're looking at here for those of you online I remind you I'm not sharing my screen but in the uh, additional materials folder of the uh, online drive, uh, you'll find slides for both sessions five and this session, session number six, so you can follow along uh, with the supporting PDF uh, documentation. Of course, for those in the class, you have that available to you uh, as well. Okay, so what is a seasonal morphology? Let's just call it the shape of society based on the time of year. That's essentially what he's looking at. Uh, where are the Inuit living? So who are the Inuit and where are they living? The Inuit, broadly speaking, right, occupy an enormous swath of land. There aren't very many of them, but their geographical distribution is extremely uh, great. Uh, all the way from uh, western, sorry, eastern Greenland, so the coast of eastern Greenland, all the way to the tip of the Aleutian Islands in Alaska, where Sarah Palin famously could see Russia from her house. Uh, so there's a huge swath of, of this northern territory over which Inuit culture uh, generally exists. There is a complementary uh, culture in Russia and also in northern Finland, Sami and so on, who are closely related, but for the particular uh, discussion today, the Inuit refers specifically to this uh, culture in the Americas, including, including Greenland. <clears throat> and the observation or the discussion of Mos is premised on this basic physical observation which is that the Inuit, really wherever you find them, although there are certainly regional differences, but broadly speaking, wherever you find them, that the Inuit lead or live in different places in the summer and in the winter. Now, as with our Kalahari, if we're looking at the Inuit, we're looking at extreme climate conditions, right? So in the summer, as you know, it's the land of permanent sun. The sun never sets above the Arctic Circle in, in, in June, July. Whereas in winter, the sun never rises, permanent darkness. So we have this climate of extremes um, up, in these, up, up in these clines. So it's perhaps not too surprising that in the context of these extreme climate variability that we would see these different patterns or modes of existence based on the season. Uh, but the, ob the basic observation is that they live, they live in different places. So depending on what time of year it is, you will have a different house, right? 
And so the first part of his discussion is essentially to talk about what those different houses are. So let's take a look at them. The first one is in the summer, they live in tents called two peaks. Um, and you can see one here, I've put up a picture. These are typically um, animal skins, sometimes typically seal skins, because remember the primary animal available to the Inuit is seal. Uh, seal skins stretched across a very rudimentary frame. Now remember, the Inuit are living in the far north above the tree line. For most of them, they have access to no timber. So if you need to do things like put up a pole, whereas we just go chop down a tree, they don't have access to that. So typically it's made out of things like whale bone. So they tend to preserve the uh, bones of whales uh, in order to provide uh, what in other societies would be provided from uh, using uh, timber, uh, timber resources. Uh, so you can see here there's a tent. There's a family that's outside the tent. You can say uh, from one end to the uh, Eskimo area to the other, this group consists of a family defined in the narrowest sense of this word. A man and his wife, or if there is room, his wives, because remember we saw that in the Inuit culture, marriage is a flexible institution based on resource distribution availability. So you have instances of polygamy as well as polyandry. Um, unmarried children, including adopted children, and in exceptional cases, an older relative. So in the summer, you live in a two-peak, and inside of your two-peak is basically your nuclear family. You, your spouse, your kids, and maybe your grandmother, if you haven't yet put her on an ice flow to invite her to the, to, to the, to the next world. <clears throat> and you'll see then that in, uh, over the course of the summer, this is the, fam this is the living arrangement of the, of the Inuit, inside of tight family, inside of tight family uh, structures. And he gives a little description. He says there is only one bench covered with skins for sleeping. Every Inuit family had a lamp, so you put your lamp in the, in, in the tent, uh, and so on. There's no partition to separate the family from, um, from guests. Thus, the family lives perfectly united within this totally, tightly closed interior. It builds and transports the summer dwelling, which is made exactly to its measure. And you'll note the word transport, because the idea of these two peaks, these tents, was you could move them around. So you take them from one place to another place, they fold up, just like a modern tent, you put it in a bag and move it around, right? So, in the, summer, uh, in the summer season, you have a life that's lived inside of the nuclear family in a condition that's characterized by intimacy and mobility, right? In the winter, they live in different structures, uh, which we'll typically call a longhouse. Uh, the most famous of the Inuit longhouses, you probably know by the name igloo, iklu. Uh, but there, it's one of several types. The uh, more general type is called a karmak. Um, and so this is a very different structure, totally unrelated to the two peak, to the tents. The Eskimo longhouse is made up of three essential elements, a passage, which begins outside. And you can see here, um, for those of you who are following online, I hope you can see, there's this entryway passage, right? And then you'll see that the longhouse itself is, is, is um, carved out of the ground and then supported with a superstructure, right, to, for, the, uh, for the roof. Um, a passage begins outside, leads into the interior via a partially subterranean entrance. Inside are benches with places for lamps and partitions which divide the bench into a certain number of sections. And I think I have a picture. Yes, can you see the bench that's here? It is an interesting feature, won't bother getting into it in great detail, but I'll simply note in passing that the idea of building a kind of oval house and putting a bench around it is remarkably common uh, feature of human architecture wherever you find it. There's a very famous site. We'll have an opportunity, I suspect, to talk about it next class. Gebekli Tepe uh, in Turkey. And one of the features of the Gebekli Tepe complex, very unusual complex, is it has a big oval uh, construction with a bench around it. Um, and in the Kung tribe, you'll, you may recall, those of you who read it in the, in, the, in the Flannery Marcus discussion, they build houses for the unmarried men. It's an oval house. It has a bench around it. So it's a, somehow it seems like a kind of a way of, a way of human thinking. Build an oval house and put a bench around it. And if you think about it, it's kind of fundamental. In fact, in a way, even monasteries uh, have this kind of thing, right? You have a big room and there's a bench around and everybody sits around. What's the advantage of bringing everybody together in an oval room with a bench? Everybody sits down. What can they all do? Everyone can see each other, right? So it seems like it corresponds to a kind of underlying innate social logic. In any event, this is the uh, style that we find also in the Inuit longhouses. <clears throat> the bench is divided into compartments by a short partition, and each of these partitions corresponds or belongs to a different family. 
and in front of each of the compartments is placed the family lamp. So remember that, recall that in the, in the two peak, you have one lamp that's placed inside the tent. The lamp, in a way, is a, is a, is a desig designation of the family. Each family has one lamp. So where the lamp is, that's where the family is. It's a sort of an assertion of presence. Not necessarily ownership, but of presence. Along the front wall is another smaller bench, which is reserved for adolescent unmarried young people or guests. In front of the house are storage places for provisions such as frozen meat, props for boats, and sometimes a kennel for dogs. And you can see here the uh, layout of a typical uh, Carmack winter, winter longhouse with different gradations and the benches going around the uh, outside and the subterranean entrance, partially subterranean entrance leading to the leading outside. Additionally, if you have, um, uh, if you don't have uh, any kind of uh, timber resources available, um, or, or whale bones and so on and so forth. The other thing you can make your longhouse out of literally is snow and ice, hence the famous igloo. We typically think of the igloo as a kind of a small individual dwelling. That's wrong. The igloo is actually a multifamily dwelling. They're not necessarily that large, but they're often interconnected. You can read it yourself, right? The, uh, he says there's usually a multiple or a composite house. Two or three igloos are linked and open onto the same passage. So it essentially follows the same logic as this plan, Right? except you're building out houses out of snow and then connecting them together. So that principle of interconnectedness is there. Um, and the igloo, like the uh, longhouse, will typically be a, uh, will, will have space for at least two families. So it's not like you have just one family per igloo. You have multiple families. And here you can see people, two families, right, sitting on their bench inside of the uh, igloo. A family consisting of a single individual, sorry, it is interesting to note that the space occupied by each family is not proportional to the number of its members. Families are considered as separate units, each equivalent to the other. A family consisting of a single individual occupies as much space as a large one cons comprising more than two generations. So the logic is the family, not the number of people, right? The family becomes, uh, is, uh, the, sorry, the number of people in the family is subordinate then to the principle of the family itself, the idea that each family gets a bench. So if it's just you, sucks to be alone, but you've got a lot of space to spread out. If you've got a lot of kids and so on, you're all cramped together. That's the nature of it. And you can see then here that the, the feature of the longhouse, right, whether it is the ice igloo longhouse or whether it is the Carmack, is that it brings multiple families together inside of the same dwelling. This is where the Inuit live in their, um, they live in winter. So two types of construction so far, the two peak, the, the mobile summer dwelling for individual families, the winter dwelling for multiple families. <clears throat> the two peak mobile can be packed up, moved from one place to another. The karmak or the igloo is a permanent structure. It stays in one place, uh, so it's not, mo it's not mobile at all. There is a third type of structure that is typically associated with much, not necessarily all, but much Inuit culture, the so-called kagi or uh, the Russian word, uh, which is the one that Maus uses, is kashim, uh, which is the so-called men's house or men's communal house. Um, again, it's another common feature across many uh, human societies to create a special building just for men. Why would that be? And it's usually just for young men, typically, right? It's like young men are so problematic, they want to like, kick us out of the house, put us in some place, right, so we don't get into too much trouble. Anyway, uh, the Kargi or Kashim is an enlarged winter house. It looks quite similar to the normal longhouse, but there, is a, there are two essential differences. First, it has a central hearth, whereas the winter house does not. What does that mean? Instead of having a heating lamp, right? Remember, each family has their own lamp. That's where their heating comes from. This has a central fireplace. So instead of having individual heating sources, you have one central hearth. And the interesting feature of that is even if there is no firewood to burn, you have a central hearth. So the central hearth is independent of its heating function. It's obviously playing a different kind of organizational function. Secondly, there are usually no compartments and often no benches, but only seats in the kashim, even when it is built of snow and it is therefore impossible to construct a single large dome. Uh, domes are joined together and walls are shaped to give the kashim the form of a large pillared hall. So it's a meeting place, a gathering, a kind of community hall. This is how he, he tends to think of it. Um, in the, in, this, in the text. It says the kashim is built exclusively during the winter, itself good evidence that it is a distinctive feature of winter life. Winter is characterized by an extreme concentration of the group, right? So as opposed to the dispersal in summer, in winter everybody's coming back together. 
Um, and so you pack all of these people inside of these longhouses and inside of these, uh, inside of these kargi, inside of the kashim. Uh, and inside of the kashim takes place a kind of communal ritual life, right? So it's, think of it almost like, we might say a temple, it's a loaded term. But the reason we might be justified in thinking of it as a temple is because of, and this is not from Moses' text, but from another text uh, called the Smithsonian at the Poles, which is kind of text that presents Smithsonian pictures from uh, around the turn of the last century. Um, when Christian missionaries first encountered Inuit societies, so remember we've seen from my text, for example, Christian missionaries love to go around the world and convert primitive people to Christianity, saving one soul for Christ at a time kind of thing, particularly Protestant missionaries. Um, when they encountered these Inuit communities, these were the buildings they first wanted to destroy, right? The, the kargi or the kashim were the primary rival to the message of the missionary, which suggests that they're therefore playing a similar kind of role as a church might play in our society. Not necessarily in the sense of any kind of theological role, but in the sense of being a focal point for a set of ritual beliefs or a set of beliefs that are reinforced through ritual practice, right? So the very fact that the missionaries wanted to destroy them, and indeed I should note succeeded in destroying them, I believe according to that article in the Smithsonian at the polls, the last Kashim in Alaska was torn down in 1910, um, that this suppression of literally the physical space where people used to get together suggests that it served a similar kind of purpose as the Christianity that these missionaries were trying to introduce. So it's a place of ceremony and ritual. It's also gendered. It's a place for men. So it's a male space for ritual and uh, ceremony. It says uh, you can see uh, Presbyterian missionaries actively sought to suppress shamanism, whaling rituals, and hunting ceremonies, along with the spiritual, spiritual concepts that underlay these practices. Inupiaq kargit, or ceremonial houses, closed down under missionary pressure, ending the ceremonies that had taken place inside. Okay, so those, that's just the architecture. Three types of building, the Tupic in summer, and then the longhouses, uh, either for family dwelling or for ceremonial purposes in winter. One mobile, the other fixed. Let's take a look at the nature of seasonal dispersion of populations. And this is from, again, this is not from most. This is from um, an article entitled Inuit Landscape Use and Responses to Climate Change in the Wollaston. Let's be honest, an article that no one is ever going to read. But I read it so you don't have to. Mikhail Sorenson, whatever his name is, Sorenson, yeah, uh, a Dane, uh, engaged in archaeological work. So we're not looking at living Inuit practices, the archaeological remains testifying to former uh, patterns of settlement amongst the Inuit of the extreme northern western Northwest coast of Greenland. I've provided a little thing from maps so you can see the the Wollaston Forland Klevering Ö is up here, right? So <laughs> go to Iceland, go straight north, and there you go. Okay, here let's look at the maps. Uh, get some some empirics here. So what are we looking at? We're looking at the evidence for dispersal of these two morphologies, right? The the summer and the winter uh, type of dwelling. Uh, and then the size of the circle indicates the number of such dwellings that are encountered in these different sites. So you can see that in these two, in these two spaces, right, on the, the coastal fjordland of, of uh, northwestern Greenland, that there are obviously spots which are suitable for hunting seal and uh, maybe other, uh, other marine and even possibly some land resources. But what do you find? You can see that in yellow is winter because that's the, uh, the turf houses, meaning the long houses that are built according to that winter system. And the red are these tent rings, right? So the stones that they used to put down to secure their tents in different places. So now these are leaving remnants of where they used to pitch their tents. So what do you see? You see that there is a kind of oscillation effect from summer to winter. During the summer, people spread out, makes sense. They're all living individually in small tents. They move to different parts as the, as the, as the weather warms up, as the seals start to, to come out. And then in winter, they retrench back again, right? So there is, you can see the clustering effect that's taking place between winter and summer. In the winter, it's much more clustered. In the summer, it's much more dis dispersed, right, in this way. And you can also see that the winter and summer implicate different geographies in this, in this context. So 
Uh, the reason for this is because the type of, or let's say the, the means of resource extraction vary significantly from summer to winter. Um, in the summer, right, when you have uh, leads opening up in the ice, so stretches of water and so on, seals tend to move around uh, in small groups or even individually, whereas in the winter they tend to cluster together in colonies. And so basically what's happening is, uh, as he puts it, that the Eskimo or the Inuit are modeling their life on the resources that they need in order to survive, which is hardly a shocking conclusion. What does that suggest? If the lives they live are essentially modeled on the resources that they need in order to stay alive, that goes back to our original point, which is this is homo subordinatus, right? This is man being subordinate to nature, that the way we get to live our life is now being defined by nature. So this sort of speaks to that idea of, of a primitive man without, um, without agency. He says, is it, <clears throat> we have already seen how strongly the Eskimo are attached to their way of life, however poor it may be, that notion of poverty. They can hardly conceive of the possibility of leading another kind of existence. Never do they seem to have made an effort to modify their technology, neither the examples they see of neighboring peoples with whom they have contact, nor the clear prospects of a better life is enough to induce them in the desire to change their ways. He gives an interesting example in the text, those of you who want to read it for yourself. He gives the point that um, uh, snowshoes, which were used by woodland Indians of northern Canada, and help you as someone who's used snowshoes a lot, since I'm a northern Canadian, uh, they're very helpful when you're going through snow. On the other hand, the, uh, the Inuit use mukmuks, right, which are kind of like soft-soled shoes. The interesting point was that there was contact between the northern woodland Indians and the Inuit. They knew of snowshoe technology. It would have helped them in terms of navigating snowy terrains. And yet they did not adopt this technology despite its apparent superiority because they're living inside of a technological complex, which to them seems perfectly fine, perfectly adequate. That's the point that he's making here, right? They're, in, they're indifferent to change. And note the point that, and the other point that I'll draw attention to, they make no effort to modify their technology. So the introduction of an external technology, at least prior to modern contact, now they all use snowmobiles and stuff, but prior to modern contact, had no impact or seems to have had very little impact in terms of the kinds of life that they led. It is by means of this technology, a social phenomenon, that Eskimo social life becomes a veritable phenomenon of symbiosis that forces the group to live like the animals they hunt. So you'll note the, the distinction that he's making, tease our conclusion a little bit, that they are rejecting or that there is a structure inside of the society that seems hardwired to reject, reject the idea of a kind of material technology, a snowshoe, introduction of something new like that. Because it would displace, or there's the threat, it would displace another technology, a social technology that exists inside of the society. So he says, this technology, a social phenomenon. And we'll come back to that, to that point. So the point being then, broadly speaking, seasonal morphology of the Inuit reflects the symbiosis of Eskimo life with the animals that they need to hunt and kill in order to survive. In the winter, therefore, as those animals themselves cluster together, so do the Inuit in the summer as they disperse, then so do the Inuit as well. And if we go back to our map from uh, Sørensen, that's presumably what we're seeing here, right? The clustering dispersal effect, even here on northwestern Greenland, reflects essentially then seasonal variation in the availability of huntable uh, resources, seals. Okay, all clear? So the interesting thing is that this seeming just different uh, architecture, living in a different place from summer to winter, in order that you could optimize your ability to kill food, also is accompanied by, or perhaps reflect, totally different ways of living your life. It would not be too much to say that the Inuit life in summer and the Inuit life in winter belong essentially to two totally different modes of social logic. Now, partly that might stem from the fact, as we've seen, that in the summer, it's individualistic. It's the individual family, the individual lamp living inside of an individual tent, whereas in the winter, it's a communal life of bringing everybody together. But the implications of this seasonal social morphology are really quite extraordinary, and that's the, to what most devotes most of the text. Let's go through some of these examples. It is just extraordinary. And I will note, I remind you, this is not exclusive to the Inuit. But similar types of seasonal social morphology have also been detected in far-flung groups, as I say, places like Southeast Asia and Amazonia. So, for example, start with, it will go, we'll just follow the logic that most provides us with here. 
The religion of the Eskimo, that religion being the one practiced in those ceremonial longhouses, right? Their uh, belief in reincarnation, uh, the idea of whale spirits and all this kind of thing. The religion of the Eskimo has the same rhythm as their social organization. There is, as it were, a summer religion and a winter religion, or better put, there is no religion during the summer. So in winter, it's a very religious society characterized by ritual and ceremonial practices. All of those are abandoned in the summer. The only rites that are practiced are private domestic rituals. Everything is reduced to the rituals of birth and death and to the observation of certain prohibition. All the myths that fill the consciousness of the Inuit during the winter appear to be forgotten during the summer. Life is that of the layman, someone who is not religious. Even magic, which is often a purely private matter, hardly appears except as a rather simple sort of medical science whose rituals are minimal. Note the contrast. The winter settlement, he says, lives in a state of continuous religious exaltation, a time when myths and legends are transmitted from generation to generation. The slightest event requires solemn intervention of the magicians, the Angekok, a minor taboo, etc. Right? So in the winter, it's a calendar filled with ceremonial moments. And in the summer, there is none. This is very extraordinary. Think about this, right? What is religion? What does religion tell you? What are the myths that surround you? What is their purpose? What is their function? It creates social cohesion, but it explains who you are, how you got there, how the world works, why it looks the way it does, right? That's the purpose of these myths. And yet here we see a society that during the summer months essentially discards the observance of those myths, the ceremonies needed to keep them alive during the summer, only then to be reanimated, reinvigorated, and intensified during the, during the winter months. You forget what you believe. I shouldn't say it's that you forget what you believe. It's obviously not that. But the observance of those beliefs essentially disappears in the summer and then reemerges uh, in the winter. Um, not only is this religious life intense in the winter, it also has a very special character which contrasts with life during the summer. It is preeminently collective. Thus, the way in which both men and objects are classified bears the imprint of this fundamental opposition between the two seasons. So versus the non-ritualized, non-ceremonial, non-religious individual summer life, we have this highly ritualized, highly ceremonial, highly uh, religious communal life in the, uh, in the winter. So that's point difference number one. No religion in the summer, intense religion in the winter. Point number two. The rules for the summer family are patriarchal, right? Each family, remember, living in its tent follows this logic of a patriarchy. <clears throat> the predominant role is held by the father as provider and by male children of hunting age. The more, they are more than just the heads of the family. They constitute its very foundation. Note the next line, right? What is the importance of the patriarchy to the family? If the father dies or has an accident or is incapacitated, his young children must be killed if they cannot be adopted. The family disappears because there's no means to keep them alive. No father, no family. By the way, that's also true of the mother because remember we have that very sharp gender divide. The father hunts, the mother prepares the meat. So if the mother dies, the father's bringing the meat but he can't prepare it, so he has to get remarried very, very quickly. And if he doesn't, then the family will also disappear. Their disappearance would necessarily result in the complete disappearance of the family. The young children, if they were not adopted within another tent, would be put to death. Other features confirm the specific character of the family. Note the relative dominance of the head of the family, the Igtuat, as it's called in Greenland, has the absolute right of command, even over his adult sons. It seems that cases of disobedience are remarkably rare. He determines where people go, how the meat gets cut up, and so on. So during the summer, we see that the Eskimo family moves into a patriarchal mode in which the father then has this position of authority and can boss everybody around, right? During the winter, the rules of domestic life are entirely different. The nuclear family, so individualized during the summer, right, because it's living in a tent, remember the one lamp and so on, disappears within a much wider group, a kind of joint family. The individuals who live under the same roof are bound not just by economic relations, but by genuine moral ties. This is clear from the kinship relations that the terminology has already revealed. There is a term for designating these kin. They are iglok atagit, however you pronounce that, house kin, housemates an individual's closest circle. So in the summer, you have a small individual family ruled over by the father. And in the winter, that notion of the individual nuclear family disappears or gets sublimated into a much larger sense of kinship. 
What then happens to patriarchy? What do you think? What's your guess? If, if the individual family is dominated by a patriarch, now you're moving into a system where the individual family is disappearing to multiple families. Can you maintain patriarchy in that context? Bunch of ego-driven men trying to tell each other what to do, right? Can't even ask for directions. Is that going to work inside of a small longhouse? Is patriarchy a good model for that? Bunch of guys who feel they've got the right to, tell, to boss everybody around. Does that sound like a good idea or a bad idea? Pretty shitty idea, which is why they don't do it. Exactly in the winter, the patriarchy disappears. And instead, command, such as it is, you can see the head is, the, is handed over to a person designated not by birth, but because of certain personal characteristics. It's not a hereditary or socially determined, social, like hereditary socially determined role. It's somebody who's earned this position simply by virtue of their, uh, how they've lived inside the community. Usually old, a good hunter, or the father of a good hunter, a rich man, rich here being defined by the owner as being an owner of an umiak, which is a kind of boat, um, a magician or an angekok, right? Um, but note, so the patriarch renounces his role inside of the family. This power is then relocated into the hands of this figure. But note, his powers are not extensive. His functions are to receive strangers, to distribute places and portions of meat. He's asked to regulate internal differences, but his rights over others is very limited. He doesn't have really much authority at all. So in the summer, you have a regimented, patriarchal, authority-driven regime. And in the winter, you have a communal, non-patriarchal, non-hierarchical system, right? Next, reflecting what he calls the genuine kinship among members. In the summer, small family, remember, living in their tent. In the winter, exchanging women, partner swapping or partner sharing. Reported in almost all Inuit society, these exchanges take place in winter between all men and women of the settlement. In certain cases, they're restricted to married couples, and sometimes they're accompanied by rituals. Generally, however, all nubile individuals, I think by nubile he means individuals capable of and or interested in having sex, take part in this sharing regime, in this swapping. Usually this practice is associated with collective winter festivities, but sometimes there is no connection. Thus, what happens in the winter? The whole idea of the nuclearized family, from everything to its hierarchical command structure, to its sexual monopoly disappears in the context of the winter longhouse. The command gets shifted over into some kind of nominal elder who has respect but no real authority. And, some, and the forms of sexual monopoly that exist inside of the marriage structure dissolve through this system of sexual exchange between all members of the group, right? I mean, it's weird. Let's just say it. That sounds weird to us, but there you go. The last point that he makes, which I didn't bother printing out here because I didn't want to just like read slide after slide after slide. But the last point he makes, which is very consistent with this, is that in the summer, the Inuit hold on to a principle of essentially what we would call private property rights, ownership of boats, ownership of tools, and so on, right? That, the, that in the summer, they are surrounded by items that they would identify as belonging to them. Whereas in the winter, individual property rights disappear and are replaced, not surprisingly, by a form of collective or communal property sharing. There is no individual property. Meat that might belong to you in the summer months now belongs to everybody in the, in the winter months. And so they live according to a private property regime in summer and a public property regime or communalism uh, in the winter. And he has uh, an extended discussion in the book itself, which you want, if you want, you can read it. Okay, so what are we seeing? If we put these things together, right, we have two totally different ways of living your life. You have a mobile, nuclearized, patriarchal, hierarchical family unit over which there is a, a monopoly sexual rights exercised in the context of that family unit, driven by private property and so on in the summer. And then in the winter, you have the complete, the complete opposite. From mobile to sedentary, from individual to community, from private to public, from the nuclear to the denuclearized, from the hierarchical to the egalitarian, 
from the non-ritual or non-ceremonial to the intensely ritual, from the non-religious to the intensely religious, from the chaste to the promiscuous. <laughs> you would think that one of these modes of living would be incompatible with the other mode of living, right? Let's just take the last one because that's probably the easiest for us to get our heads around. Either you're living in a closed marriage in which you have monopoly privileges over the sexuality of your partner, or you're living in an open marriage in which you don't. But you're probably not living in both, right? Either that's important to you or it's not. But it can't exist as both states. Either you're living in a world that's informed by the logic of mobility, or you're living in a world that's informed by the logic of sedentarization. But he can't really think of living in both. To our modern eyes, right, to the way that we see these, we see these as opposites, not as complementary. It's one or the other. That's why I suggest the word we should use is these are antinomial, right? These are antinomies. Both are perfectly viable, but they are mutually incompatible, right? One, one model of life is simply incompatible with the other model of life. And yet, we find all across the Inuit world, this is the pattern of existence that they follow. And what is driving it? It's being driven by the fundamental underlying condition of resource availability. When in the summer, resources are relatively abundant, we see one form of existence. And then in the winter, when resources are relatively scarce, we see another form of existence. So if we think about the logic, what does that mean? In the summer, it's easy for me to keep myself and my family alive just by virtue of my own hard work. In order to make that efficient, I'm going to tell people what to do, where to go, what to hunt, and it's going to work fine because we'll be able to get the food that we need to eat. In the winter, when resources disappear, at that point, my ability to keep myself and my family alive is constrained. What am I going to need? I'm going to need the help of other people. At that point, the individual life that makes a lot of sense for survival in the summer is now working against me were, to I keep that, were I to keep that system going in the winter. At that point, in order for me to optimize my survival chances and the chances of my family, I'm going to want to live inside of some kind of collective communal logic. My own individuality is going to need to be subordinated to a group identity. And that's then going to help me optimize survival in the context of this environment. Hence, in order for me to optimize my survival overall, it makes sense for me to practice one mode of existence in the summer and another mode of existence in the winter. And what makes those reconcilable is we're not seeing it as a set of incompatible cultural practices, but as part of the same cultural practice that's linked to a social optimization principle, how best to survive in these kinds of environments. Is that clear? So what are the conclusions that we can, that we can draw from this? The first and perhaps most extraordinary is that uh, forms of social life that we think of as fundamentally incompatible can coexist within the same cultural complex, right? And we see this through the resolution of these apparent antinomies, hierarchy to egalitarian, patriarchal, non-patriarchal, etc., resolved through bimodal forms of existence defined seasonally. And I should emphasize reinforced ritually. And usually when we find ritual reinforcement, what we're finding is cultural reinforcement, right? That's the purpose of ritual, is essentially to teach the culture. Uh, so the, the intense ritualistic life of the winter presumably relates to the viability then of this alternative summer existence. Inuit society, therefore, is, is characterized by this seasonal oscillation defined by axes of resources and geography, if you follow my kind of my, uh, my image that I'm trying to, to, identify, uh, to, to build. And this bimodal or seasonal morphology, bimodal uh, form of existence, implicates the most fundamental aspects of Inuit culture, really human culture, right? Who you are, who your family is, the power that you have, your sexual identity, and the things that are yours, right? The most fundamental features of who we are, family, power, identity, sexuality, and property rights. All of those are implicated at the most elemental level by this bimodal form of, uh, of existence. How are they able to do this, given that when we first were, if I were to tell you this without any context, I'd be like, nope, not possible. Can't do that. 
can exist. What makes this possible? And here's the word that we saw before that most was using a couple of slides below. It is a form of social technology. The Inuit reject the technological innovations of their southern neighbors like snowshoes, who needs those, in part because of the importance of the social technology they've embedded inside of their own society that makes it work, function, that optimizes it in the context of these extreme conditions of life. So when we look at the, we ask the question, what is it that allows us to explain how these antinomial states are resolved? The answer is they're resolved through technology. They're resolved through a social technology that enables these two modes of existence to function within the same society compatibly, one with the other, even though we would think of them as incompatible, right? So it is not unreasonable then to say that the underlying explanation for why it is that Inuit society works and has worked for such a long period of time despite spreading out over some of the most inhospitable conditions that the earth has to offer is because they were able to use the human cognitive power to solve problems using technology, just like we do today. That's what we're hardwired to do, use our brains, use our curiosity, use our reason, use our thinking to solve problems through technology. The issue, of course, is when we think about, we first see that, it doesn't look to us like technology. When the Protestant missionaries, you can just imagine if you're some like super earnest Protestant missionary and you go visit some Inuit village in Alaska for the first time, and here are all these men stripped naked to the waist, chanting strange things in a longhouse, and it couldn't have smelled very nice. And then that night, they're all exchanging partners with each other. What are you thinking? Look at this amazing technology. Is that what the Christian missionary was thinking? No. What are you thinking? Honey, I'm going to need more Bibles. These people desperately need to be saved. Right? You're going to look at this as demonstration of unremitting primitiveness. Look how backwards these people are. Look how little they have. Look how stuck they are in their primitive state. What you're not going to see is an entire technological complex that enables people to live in circumstances which would defy most organisms from being able to thrive. And yet they have lived up there for thousands and thousands of years. Let's go back and recall the formula that I presented to you at the beginning of our class, right? This question of how we look at the past, how we look at our own modernity. Human agency raised to the power of technology equals the modern self. If we're thinking of technology as Ubers and Teslas and space exploration and iPads, then we're going to look at the Inuit society and say they are a-technological. In fact, we would go one further than that. They reject actively, apparently, the introduction of improving technologies such as snowshoes. So they seem to be aggressively anti-technological, the very definition of primitive, right? And since, remember also our caveat, technology is the exercise of human reason when we use our cognitive abilities rationally in order to improve a problem. That is reason making itself manifest, right? So technology is the evidence of our reason. Therefore, an atechnological society is irrational, living outside of reason, which puts us back into the paradigm. How is it that modern humans, for 97% of our existence, despite the fact that they seem to have all the modern cognitive, behavioral, and psychological features that we have today, we're content in living irrational, atechnological, backward, primitive lives. The answer is we're not looking in the right place for the technology. The technology of the Inuit is obviously pretty advanced insofar as it enabled incompatible modes of existence to coexist peacefully over a very long period of time, over a very large region, uh, to enable these communities to survive. But we don't see it as technology, because that's not what we think of technology as, because we've made technology material. That's the story of modernity that we tell ourselves. We look at tools and objet d'art and paintings, the things that we can observe, the things that leave a trace, the things that we make, that is technology.
the things that we do, the social cultural practices that we in embed inside of our society, we don't think of that as technology. Instead, we're much more inclined to see it simply as an example of the primitivism of people who don't have, uh, who don't have technology. But in fact, I'm going to argue it's the reverse. The Inuit system is indeed a rational cultural system enabled by the same kind of technological thinking that in a different context provides us with quantum physics and Teslas and iPads. So by way of uh, conclusion, a couple of discussion points to think about. This notion then that the Paleolithic past, our distant ancestors, were stuck living in small kinship groups characterized by tremendous poverty, bare subsistence, and a kind of deep egalitarianism is probably very unlikely. Because the examples we have closer to hand of people living in these states shows us something very, very different. It's very likely that our Paleolithic past, the ancestors of our Paleolithic past, had similar types of complex accommodation that, just as we see it today, reflects the ge ge uh, geography and resources inflected by forms of social technology. And this then reinforces the idea that cultural judgments derived from material evidence will overlook prehistoric complexity, prehistoric technology, right? We're not seeing the technology where it was being deployed. Which invites us then to ask how we should think of or evaluate our own categories of technology and innovation. We're constantly being told, go out and innovate. We should be technologically this and so on and so forth, right? We need a lot of technology and we need a lot of innovation to solve the horrendous problem that your parents, grandparents, and great-grandparents have made just for you and your kids, right? I think we all agree that as the earth gets warmer and habitats start to collapse in on themselves and food systems disappear and large numbers of people are put under threat, that the solution to that problem, if there is one, is going to be the leveraging of unprecedented amounts of human technology and human innovation. Therefore, I invite you to consider how important it is that we ask the right questions of the technology and innovation that we are capable of producing. If by technology all we mean are gigantic carbon capture machines that we stick in Iceland to try and suck out carbon from the air, or things like this, we are limiting, in fact, the human cognitive power to be technological and to be innovative. The real technology and the real innovation we have is to be able to create these multivariant forms of social existence that optimize the communities for which those rules were drawn up in the first place. And a society that is under threat is not really facing a material technological problem. It's facing definitionally a social technological problem. And so in this way, although it seems remote and distant to us, no less, from this vantage point as from any other in the recent past, nonetheless, what the Inuit example I think shows us is a clear living demonstration of the capacity of human cognition to be technological and to be innovative, even if at first glance that does not appear to be the case. And we're left then with this idea that perhaps our prehistoric past had a lot of complexity, it's simply that it didn't leave a trace that we are able to see. We'll come back to that point uh, when we join, when we come back next time, we'll talk about the uh, pattern of sedentization, uh, the rise of the Neolithic Revolution. We'll look at the Kelly book on complexities, the life ways of hunter-gatherers. We'll look at the Scott book, and we'll ask the question, if we're capable of this kind of existence, why is it that we change it fundamentally and swap it out for uh, agriculture, states, politics, and all the other stuff? What's going on? And we'll look at that question then in greater detail. Okay, I will stop there. Thank you very much, and I will see you folks uh, next time.